Good morning, and I would like to discuss today, today uh, the difference between a high redshift galaxy uh, far, far away and uh, the normal galaxies which we see nowadays and a little bit talk about the disk instabilities because I think there's a misunderstanding and things are completely different, although I don't really know a lot about why they are different, but that's basically what it is. Uh, if you go to high redshift, um, star forming galaxies in some sense are similar to low redshift galaxies. They follow a fundamental plane, uh, you know, a star forming sequence, where the star formation rate is proportional to the stellar mass. And in fact, the stellar mass is not very different to present day galaxies. It lies between 10 to 10 and 10 to 11 solar masses, maybe a few 10 to 9 solar mass galaxies. But the star formation rates, as you know, are much bigger. They are between a 10 to 1,000 solar masses per year, so much, much larger than what we see nowadays. Uh, the reason for this appears to be, also I think, and nobody really understands this, the fact that the galaxies at high redshift are very gas rich. And that is basically shown here. If you look at one of Reinhard, Sim, uh, Reinhard uh, Gensler and his group observations, then you see the gas fraction in present day galaxies is of order a few percent. Whereas if you go to the high redshift uh, regime, then you basically have 50, 60 percent of baryons in the gas, and therefore it seems at first likely that the star formation rates must be high. Well, um, you can all cast this into one simple model, which we all love and know. It's uh, the bathtub model, which says the reason that these galaxies are gas rich is due to the fact that they accrete the gas like crazy. And uh, so this is the, the, the old story. You have an accretion rate of gas, and the accretion rate in equilibrium is equal to what the, the gas which you consume, and the gas you consume is proportional to the star formation rate times one minus the return fraction of gas from the stars. And in addition, you lose some gas through the wind, and the wind loading factor alpha is whatever, one or two, and it's probably the wind loss rate is probably all proportional to the star formation rate too. We do it like this because that makes everything simple. And then you see this is about 50%, this is about 1, so you get here a factor 1.5, and then you e immediately see that the star formation rate in the galaxy is indeed proportional to the accretion rate, or the effective accretion rate, if you divide this by 1.5. So the idea has been the star formation rate must be high, this is simple, simply because the accretion rate at high redshifts is large. Now the, the question why these galaxies are gas rich is more of a problem. You could say the galaxies are young, but they are not young. If you look at their stellar mass, it's 10 to 11 to 10, 10 to 10 to 10 to 11 solar masses. This is very similar to present day galaxies. They already formed an enormous amount of stars, but they are still gas rich. So the question is why are they gas rich? And uh, again, it's probably because of the accretion rate. You know, the gas mass is the accretion rates times the star formation time scale. Uh, the stellar mass didn't, is the same as in low redshift galaxies, so the gas fraction is high because the accretion rate is high. But this is too simple. This assumes that the depletion time scale or the star formation time scale is universal. It's the same for high redshift and low redshift galaxies. But why should that be so? No, the gas, cold gas, can turn into stars in 10 to 5 years. And if the depletion time scale in high redshift galaxies, for whatever reason, would be 10 to 7 years, their gas fraction would be 1% or 0.1%. So they would be gas poor. So it's due to the fact that this depletion time scale is not dependent on redshift that we get the gas rich galaxies. And I don't think we really understand this very well. Why is the depletion time scale always 10 to 9 years and not redshift dependent? and so on. Well, there's more to the high redshift galaxies, which we understand less. Uh, and this is the kinematical property. So here you see on the left side rotation where there's R1 half, half mass radius of these high redshift galaxies. And there's a very nice correlation. The rotation increases when the half mass radius increases. Uh, it's very similar to low redshift galaxies. You know, at a 1 kiloparsec, you have something like 30, 40 kilometers a second. At 10 kiloparsecs, you get to 300 kilometers a second. Similar rotation, half mass, half uh, uh, light radius relationship. But this is completely uh, uh, unexpected. The reason is. What's the color 
Uh, yeah, no, 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 I don't go into these details. These are different, uh, um, diff different uh, um, Redshift service which have been put together from Reinhardt. So these are the newest data set by Newman et al. These are the, red, the blue dots are the older since data. So that's... It's all yeah, it's all Redshift 2. You know, I took out the Redshift 1. They have the Redshift 1 in it. The green dots are the Redshift 1. Take them away. Out to be there. Okay, so that's, that's similar to the low Redshift, but this is not expected. The reason is at redshift 2, the universe uh, is a factor 3 to the third power denser. Yeah? And so you would expect the rotation to be a factor 10 faster for the same radius, because everything is denser, and it's not the case. Uh, so there's something really funny with these kind of galaxies. In addition, the dispersion, which you see on the right side of the gas, seems to be not dependent on R1 half. You know, it might be a little dependence, goes from 60 maybe to 50, but who cares about this minor uh, dependence? So somehow these galaxies are all uh, driven by high irregular motion. I wouldn't call it turbulence uh, because I don't really know whether it's turbulence. I haven't ever seen anyone showing me a Kolmogorov spectrum, so who knows what this is. Uh, but the interesting thing is then, of course, if dispersion is constant, rotation decreases, the compact galaxies are uh, dispersion dominated. Not because they have high dispersion, but their rotation is small, and the extended galaxies are rotation dominated. That's what it is, and we would like to understand that. Well, there has been um, another morphological difference uh, claimed in high redshift galaxies, which is their clumpiness. If you look at these high redshift galaxies, often you find rings, and if you look carefully in these rings, you do find massive clumps. The clumps are of order 10 to in solar masses, and the sizes of these clumps are one kiloparsec, and it had been claimed that uh, this is the most important part, the clump part is what drives star formation, the star formation is happening in the clumps, and the winds which we get from these clumps might explain the outflow. So it, everything is now talking about clumps, everybody now tries to understand how these clumps form. Well, there has been some understanding, but I think this is wrong. And that's why I would like to bring it up. The idea has been that galaxies always like to live at the edge of uh, stability with a tumor Q parameter, which is of order one. Q is defined like that. It's a sound speed or the, uh, uh, if, if this, if, if the, or the velocity dispersion if that is larger than the sound speed times epicyclic frequency divided by pi g uh, surface density of the gas. And you know very well if Q is larger than one, then these galaxies are supported by pressure and by a centrifugal force, and so they, uh, no clumps can form. And if uh, Q becomes smaller than one, then you actually uh, get a range where the galaxies become unstable. They cannot be unstable on very small scales because the pressure dominates. They cannot be unstable on very large scales because you have uh, the tidal forces. And so the range in radii where the galaxies are unstable, this range it, it con uh, uh, um, uh, collapses to one single radius if Q is one, and you get a large range, a larger range of radii when Q becomes smaller than one. And the idea had been that these galaxies live at Q equal 1 because if they have values Q larger than 1, then there is no turbulence, no irregularities. And this, any turbulence dissipates, so the sigma decreases. And when sigma becomes more smaller than 1, you get lots of clumpiness, and then the sigma increases again. So the galaxies like to live at 1. Now you can cast this equation into a more convenient uh, equation, which is shown down here. If you introduce uh, the gas fraction, which is gas mass divided by dynamical mass, and here I assume that dark matter in the inner region is negligible, then you find that Q is square root of 2 divided by delta times sigma over V rot. And that seems to explain very nicely the high redshift galaxies. You know, delta is of order 0.5, and so you see immediately that the sigma must be large uh, uh, in these galaxies because, you know, you get something sigma over V rot of order uh, 20, 30 percent. The fastest growing wavelength, uh, which is just uh, the wavelength which can grow at Q equal 1, is then delta times R, which of course is of order the disk scale length. R is the disk scale length, and the mass of the clumps goes is delta square. And so if you have delta of order 0.3, then the mass of the clumps is typically 10% of the disk, which is also large. So that was the idea behind this uh, Q equal 1 business. But I think it is not working. Why is it not working? Well, linear theory does not apply. This is linear theory. But these galaxies are not linear. Now you look at the clumpiness. 
you can say they are just guide now becoming nonlinear, so we are still see linear theory, but it's wrong. They have already 10 to 11 solar masses of stars. They have been nonlinear for quite a long time to form all, the, all of these stars. Uh, this is a theory that leads to rings, but galaxies are not axisymmetric. We do not see rings, we see clumps. Sometimes the clumps are in the ring, but the clumps are the properties which we want to understand. It's not clear whether a disk that once has become unstable and then you, you generate irregularities and Q goes above one formally should be stabilized again. I have never seen this in any simulation. So who knows, once the disk is unstable, it might be unstable forever. So this is also not clear. Then uh, if you take this for granted and say delta is of order 0.5, you would expect sigma to be proportional to Virot. But that's not the case. Virot changes from 20 kilometers a second to 400 kilometers a second, sigma is always 60. It's not what you would expect from this relationship. Uh, finally, most of the molecular mass is not in the massive clumps. The clumps have 10 to 9 solar masses. We have five, six clumps, six, 10 to 9 solar masses. But the galaxies have six, 10 to 10 solar masses of gas, molecular gas. So actually, most of the gas is not in the clumps. And that might mean most of the star formation doesn't happen in the clumps, but happens uh, in between the clumps, there are things which we don't resolve. And finally, um, if you do this tumor instability business, and Avisha has written several papers on that, uh, then you, should sh you show that the clumps should be fast rotating because they feed from the shear flow of the galaxy disk, and uh, this is not being observed. So something seems to be completely different. Now, um, because of that, um, I hired a graduate student. Yeah, my, my trailer. The, the, what the, for the big galaxies? How do you know that the clumps are not rotating? Yeah, yeah, yeah bec well, this is, this, this is what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a long debate between Avishai and, and Reinhardt on that, and you better ask him. Uh, I keep out of this. It's, a ni it's nice to sit with a glass of beer next to them and let them talk and you drink, but I don't get into this business because it's... <laughs> yes, they rotate much less than what you would expect. That's at least you can say. They, there might be some rotation, but it's not that V over sigma is of order one or so, uh, it's of order two or so, it's maybe of order one, yeah. Yeah, that's what he says. Well, I will tell you that this tumor business is wrong anyway, so don't worry about it anymore. It's, uh, oh, who cares about this? It's not, okay. And this is a, a work that has been done by Manuel Behrendt. Manuel is a great student of mine, and he is now looking into this and we say we do the most simple case. We don't do cosmology, don't resolve the scales and then put a lot of mess in it and then get the mess out and then don't know what we can get everything or did we do any physics. We do a very simple case, take a disk, unstable, homogeneous, smooth and see what happens. Uh, this has been done by Fred Bruno before and we wanted to do it uh, again. And so we started with a smooth disk. You can see this is quite smooth. Um, uh, a scale length of 16 kiloparsec, uh, and uh, at this grade 16 kiloparsec, scale length of five, a mass of 310 embedded in an environment which uh, mimics a dark matter halo. It's a constant rotation curve roughly with 10 to 11, so delta is 0.3, and we used Ramses. And the first thing we noticed is uh, um, it is very hard to resolve the disk scale length. The disk scale length, if you would have 10k gas, is tiny. It's very, very small. And we found out that you need to resolve the scale length with at least 5 to 10 grid cells to get the, uh, uh, the scale height, sorry, the scale height, yes, sorry, scale, scale height, with 5 to 10 grid cells to make any sense. And that would be if you would take a 10k gas of order a few AU, uh, well, it's maybe 100 AU, so yeah. So too small to resolve. Uh, now people say this, I don't care, I'd never resolve it, and later on turbulence forms and whatever, the irregularities, and they drive then the scale height up. But if they do it that way, and then they later on resolve it, they might have done something completely wrong. If they would have resolved the scale height from the initial condition, they might have never had gotten turbulence. So you start with the wrong initial condition, you get something out, which later on you can resolve, but are you really doing the right thing? I'm not sure. So we wanted to do it correctly, and that means in order to resolve the scale height with this kind of resolution, we had to start with 10 to 4 Kelvin, not 100 Kelvin or 10 Kelvin would never resolve it. 10 to 4 Kelvin, we kept it isothermal, 
to do it in a simple way and then looked what happened. Well, what do you expect? Uh, how many structures do you expect? You know, delta, I said, is around 0.3. You expect roughly then 10 structures, 10 clumps to form. This is a tumor Q, which you have in this kind of environment. And if you know Q, then you can basically, you see it, it goes above one at a radius of about 11 kiloparsecs. We wouldn't expect in any instabilities out there. Uh, here we would expect instability. And actually you can work out, if you know Q and the kappa, you can work out what the fastest growing wavelength is. And you see it's here of order half a kiloparsec and then it increases to about 10 kiloparsecs. So this is the fastest growing wavelength, but these wavelengths would also grow. They are growing with less rate, so less fast. And the interesting question is, this is kind of the range of growth out here stable. And the question is, is this fastest growing wavelength winning or do the other ones take over? So who knows? So that's why we wanted to understand that. Okay, once you know the fastest growing wavelength, then you can fix the inner ring and then you can work out what the next ring can form because the inner ring has a thickness of the fastest growing wavelength. And then you get the next ring and the next ring, you can work out how many rings you could form and you come up with about 11 rings. That's roughly delta, one over delta square as I said. So this is 11 structures that you can form. And in fact, if you do the simulations, this is exactly what we find. We find exactly this the, the, the separation of rings as shown here. So that was a very nice confirmation of, uh, but it, if you don't resolve the scale height, you don't get anything like that. It's a complete mess, it's all wrong. You all really have to resolve the scale height to get that. It's either thermal, yes. Well, it's just do it because it's a simple test, a simple um, um, theoretical investigation. It's not uh, the, the high redshift galaxies, but I don't care. I want to understand. The yeah, I told you reality in a second. Wait a minute. I tell you what I learned from this. Yeah. Okay. I tell you what it means in a second. Yeah. Okay. So this is how the thing evolves. And you basically see uh, what happens. You form the inner rings first because the, uh, the collapse time scale or the uh, tumor time scale is shorter. And then the rings are actually breaking up into fragments and then you form rings further and further out. What happens is the rings collapse onto themselves on a certain time scale and then form clumps. And while the outer clumps are just beginning to form, the inner clumps are beginning to merge. So what you see already here is the sim simple arguments we always present is we should expect 11 clumps. Eh? But obviously you do not form 11 clumps, you form many, many more. Why do you form many more? Because the clump formation happens when the rings have collapsed into a thin line and the thin line fragments. Its gene's length, wait a minute, its gene's length is much smaller than uh, the original gene's length or the original tumor length. And therefore the number of fragments you get is much, much, much more. So you cannot use a simple delta argument, we, uh, you know, they are very tiny, yes? They are very tiny and later on they grow. And of course they grow, but it's a completely different process. It's not tumor instability anymore. It's merging of clumps. It's a completely physics that we are talking about to get to big clumps. It's not the tumor argument that you can use. So that's the first thing which we learned. We also looked at the wavelengths, and I said we have several wavelengths and we, that can grow, but only the fastest growing wavelengths takes over, so that works very nicely, so that you can use to work out where your rings are forming and you can show that actually the other wavelengths go less, less fast than either wavelengths, all perfectly in agreement with the tumor as long as you are axisymmetric. But once you break up, the whole situation is very different. Uh, interesting was when these rings began to collapse onto themselves. People usually lose the tumor time scale to tell uh, us when fragments should form. But we find that the collapse time scale, which is given here, this is, a, this is the numerical result, and this is the tumor time scale, is 10 times longer. It's of order a few 10 the 8 years, not a few 10 the 7 years. So if you really want to calculate how quickly your disk fragments, you should use a time scale which is 10 times longer, not uh, the tumor time scale. That is of maybe of some interest. Uh, here is what happens in details. Uh, these are the density maxima, and you see here the rings forming at the distances as we would expect them. This is when the rings collapse onto themselves and begin to fragment, and then you get a whole mess. 
This is the turb what we call turbulent state of a galaxy. This is the initial linear state of a galaxy. And uh, the question of this, of course, is, is this mess at all related to the tumor analysis, uh, which we always use. Um, these simple formulas which we use, which are kind of based on the linear stability analysis, do we get something similar for magical reason? Or is this met mess leading to something completely different? So the first thing is we looked at the number of clumps. As I said, we would expect nine clumps to form, but we got much more. And here's the evolution. You see uh, how many clumps, you see when, when another ring becomes unstable, you see a peak in the clumps, clump formation, because here this is here, this ring becomes, and this ring becomes unstable, then this ring becomes unstable. And here you see how uh, many clumps you have at function of disk radius. And you see you get in the instability first a lot of clumps, but then the clumps begin to merge. And after some time, uh, the system has fragmented, and then you get a constant number of clumps. It's not such that the clumps merge and merge and merge, and you get less and less clumps. The reason is the most massive clumps are disrupted again. If the clumps become larger than the tidal radius in the galaxy, they break up again. So you get a continuous a structure, basically, at the very end, of all the 150 clumps, that's the equilibrium. It's much more than you would have predicted from tumor, and it's an equilibrium situation. This is the clump mass distribution. This is where we would expect it to have been from tumor instability. And you see it's completely different. Initially, we get small clumps, but of course, the, the massive clumps grow by merging. But once they reach this tumor mass, which is interesting, uh, they break up. There are uh, not many forming out there. They break up again. So the tumor mass is indeed interesting. It tells us the most massive clump that ever can form. But it's not the typical mass of the clumps. Most of the molecular gases are much smaller clumps, and only a few, five or six massive clumps are forming. That's ex exactly what the observers tell us. But the observers say this is where the action happens. And I would say here is where the action happens. This is the diffuse part, which is 10 times more than the clump mass, which the observers don't resolve. And if you want to understand the high of galaxies, look at this here, and don't look at this here. This is uh, interesting, but not interesting if you want to understand the evolution of the whole galaxies. We you see the mass-size relationship of these clumps. The size is given by this complex kinematics, because the clumps have substructure. And interesting enough, you form a mass-size relation, m goes as r square. I don't know why. It just happens to be so. And you see, this, this is well established. And once it's established, it stays like that. The red dot is the mean size and the mean mass, so to say. Average and you see you get an equilibrium. The clumps get sizes of kiloparsec. The most massive clumps have a size of a kiloparsec and a mass of 10 to the 9. And then they break up and start down there again and do the whole cycling again. You get something in equilibrium. Uh, it's very nice. You get uh, the other thing, but the most action happens again down there. So uh, I would say tumor is somehow works in an unstable disk, but uh, only as an upper limit. That's all you can learn from this. Well, uh, here you have a little more details of, you see basically the, the colors show you how massive the clumps are and you see how they form in these rings. Uh, there's another ring-like structure forming and then you can look where your massive clumps are and you will see they are all over the place. They are not always in the inner region. Of course, uh, there are some in the inner region and they, in, in the later on you get also some in the outer regions. This is maybe of less importance. Now, let's look at the velocity dispersion. What happens to the velocity dispersion? which is the irregular motion of the clumps. And indeed, you see that the velocity dispersion is increasing. It's starting very small, and it's going up, and it reaches of order 40, 50 kilometers a second. This is roughly what you would expect from tumor instability. But I told you, it's not an, the simple tumor theory. It's something more complex. Still, you get roughly the right dispersion. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little off, but, but you get roughly the right way. What is the tumor Q? Initially, it is of order 0 0.5, 0 0.6. It grows, and then it reaches actually a plateau at one. But once the rings break up, this is still tumor instability. So this works. But then the rings break up, and then you see the Q does all kinds of things. So um, it stays of order. One-ish, but it's not one-ish. It's uh, I told you I'll try to keep to, to keep to the time. So um, I'm done anyway. Um, so it's but it's more like two, and I would say this is what you would expect. This is a highly nonlinear case. Why should Q bit be be be, uh, be be smaller than one? 
it, could, it's, it can be larger than one. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what it all means and so on, but, but basically I would say one has to be a little careful with this. And I'm at the end of my uh, talk anyway, so what I would say, the tumor theory correctly predicts the growth of rings. Rings in an unstable disk situation are like this, and some of the clumps are seen in rings, so maybe these rings are the leftover parts of a linear stability. Uh, but, um, and, and also we get the right uh, uh, number of perturbations, um, and, uh, and the vastest growing wavelength is always wing, and this is okay. The collapse time of the rings to form clumps is nine times the tumor time scale, whatever this is worth uh, and interesting for. And then the fragmentation of rings leads to a number of clumps. How many clumps form depend on how thin the rings are. How thin the rings are depends either on your resolution or your thermodynamics. The rings would collapse an infinitely thin spindle if they could, and then you get an infinite number of clumps. So, because it's the, the size of the clumps is given by the thickness of the ring. So, I could get any number of clumps depending on whether I read the rings up or whatever I do. So, this is something which is not determined by the tumor theory. And the fragments are initially small, despite Q being of order one, but then they begin to grow. And fascinating enough, the most massive clump is actually exactly what you predict from tumor theory which is maybe due to the fact that more massive clumps, as Tumor would also say, are tightly torn apart. So they can't grow beyond a certain size and mass. And that you get at the end of a self-regulated time independent clump mass spectrum and size distribution, which is not dominated by the massive clumps. They are only the tip of the iceberg. And this is where the action happens, which uh, Reinhardt can't see in his observations. Uh, and, and the candles, uh, he probably also cannot see. And so this is something which I think is most important. The tumor theory does not apply to the observed high redshift nonlinear phase uh, uh, of these star forming galaxies in general, also we might learn something using tumor. Okay, so that's what I would like uh, to say to you, and, and thank you for listening. This is, this is rare, let me say, this is rare that he doesn't disagree. But he formulated it not, I agree, he said, I, does not, I do not disagree, which is already is a... So <laughs> okay, Mark, sorry. Yes. Precisely right. Sure, sure. We have, I know, it's exactly the case. We get a, a peak in the mass spectrum, but we don't resolve the low mass clumps. If we would resolve, we probably would get a power law distribution of masses. Which is exactly exactly. So in some sense, the high redshift galaxies are not different than low redshift galaxies. They have more massive clumps because they have more mass. And so n equal one is reached at higher masses. Yeah, that is my story. This is exactly so. They are similar, but the most of the action happens not in the most massive clumps, but. but then why is it, why does that mean in the because two. Why, why? Why does it? Well, okay. Yeah. Why does it uh, work for tumor? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the the tumor has included this condition that clumps are disrupted when they are too large. This is part of tumor, yeah? and so that explains why the most massive clumps are at the tumor limit. I think that makes sense. But why the dispersion is similar to tumor, I don't know. To Q1 or 2, I don't know. You know, this random motion of the clumps, why that regulates to something Q of 1 and 2, I don't know yet. Uh, this is a random n body simulation with merging and correlation and dispersal. So this has to be worked out. Right. Let's get another question. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, how about your Well, it's not no, still. Well, if you start with a very cold n body disk, particle disk, yes. immediately we will get clumps. Yes, I, I think there might be uh, gas flux and flash to form clumps. There might be what, I guess? Uh, gas flux and flash to form clumps. Yeah, okay. Well, you don't have the pressure 
the thermal pressure in the in the in the in the gas in, in the stellar simulations, but the thermal pressure is more compared to the to the turbulence anyway in this case. So I think the initial tumor instability would be almost exactly the same if you would do it with an n-body system. But later on, the clump evolution and the breakup and all of these things are different, of course, because that is given by pressure and all kinds of things. Also, the fragmentation of the rings depends on internal pressure, which in the, in the n-body simulations doesn't exist. So the fragmentation of the rings indeed might be a thermodynamic effect, where the rings break up, it, it heat up, so I agree. <coughs> Many of them don't have this at all. They're yeah. elongated. These disks are not thin. So yeah. mm -hmm. what we've discovered, the simulations without and then with radiative feedback, mm -hmm. is that without radiative feedback, we have a number of clumps that's very similar to what you showed, mm -hmm. lots and lots of small clumps, mm -hmm. not a few massive ones. Mm -hmm. With radiative feedback, the small clumps are simply not there. Ah. The clumps are mm -hmm. not smaller than about 10 to the 8. They're all in the range of about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses, and the disks are thick. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be in accord with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And the reason I assume is that there's a lot of pressure being put into the gas. By yeah. The Radiation pressure. pressure is not in, and it might change the subject. But now we now basically can put it in. We can now redo the things with radiation pressure and open the magnetic fields or what you want and see how they change the picture. It still be that, tumory, that a simple tumor analysis doesn't apply. Yeah. But Who knows? Story yes. Of but the disks are, yes. Is the disks are thick in the sense this is what we would predict for the thin tumor instability disk. And you don't see it. And so basically, you need to take this effect into the count that, into account that the disks have a thickness and not infinitely thin. But I agree with you. They are additional. Uh, Marcella is completely right, of course. It's, uh, you can put in lots of physics now. But I thought the first things I learned from this, I hadn't known before. Yeah? This kind of equilibrium structure and the most massive clumps being the tumor mass. I didn't know before, so I learned something from this, and I want to share it with you. And now you know this, now I can tell you more complex situation. But I'm always just doing the complex part and not understanding the basics I don't like so much. Okay, let's uh, thank Andreas again. Uh.